Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Natus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my nephrology playlist. In previous videos, we talked about the embryology and anatomy of the kidneys. We talked about nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome in detail. After that, we talked about acute kidney failure, pre-renal azotemia, intra-renal azotemia, and post-renal azotemia. If you remember, one of the most common causes of acute renal failure included 1. Hypoperfusion of the kidney and 2. Toxicity to the kidney. And we said hypoxic and toxic. These are the two most common causes. When it comes to chronic renal failure or chronic kidney disease, the most common causes include diabetes and hypertension. Never ever forget that. Normal functions of the kidney are many. It regulates your acid base balance and it gets rid of waste products like urea and creatinine. It also makes EPO, which tells the bone marrow to make more red blood cells. As you can imagine, in chronic kidney disease, the kidney is unable to maintain your water balance, your acid-base balance, so you tend to develop acidosis. Moreover, this poor kidney will not be able to secrete EPO and you will develop anemia because your bone marrow is not making enough red blood cells thanks to the lack of EPO. The ancient Greeks talked about the good life. How can we live a good life? Let me tell you what makes a good kidney. A good kidney is capable of getting rid of waste products, leaving less waste in the blood. The BUN to creatinine ratio should be greater than 15 for reasons that we have discussed before in this nephrology playlist. A good kidney should not waste lots of salt in the urine because salt is precious to the body. So the fractional excretion of sodium should be less than 1% and the urine sodium should be low. Relatively speaking, a good kidney is capable of concentrating your urine, raising the urine osmolality. A good kidney is capable of producing a robust volume of urine, about 1 to 2 liters every day. Please watch the videos in this nephrology playlist in order, as well as many videos in my lab's playlist. A normal kidney is like a good colander, capable of refining, clearing the juice for you, and yielding clear fluid, while catching the waste and the debris behind. Similar a good kidney is a kidney that is able of reabsorbing the good stuff back to your blood while getting rid of the waste in the urine. What do you think is going to happen in chronic kidney disease? The exact opposite. The kidney is unable to reabsorb these. That's why, for example, we have too much sodium in the urine in chronic kidney failure. Moreover, this kidney is unable to get rid of the waste in the urine. So all of that waste is going to end up in your blood. High urea and high creatinine in the blood. So what's a good kidney? A good kidney clears the stuff out. How about nephrotic syndrome? I'm losing too much protein in the urine. How about nephritic syndrome? I'm losing blood in the urine. How about kidney failure? The waste is piling up in my blood and I'm losing salt in the urine. And this poor kidney is unable to concentrate my urine and in many cases cannot dilute the urine either. So whether I drink too much water or too little water, the urine doesn't change its osmolality. Isn't that crazy? Yep, that's the story of disease. When the kidney cannot concentrate or dilute the urine, it's called isosthenuria. Let's break that down. What does uria mean? Urine. How about iso? Same. How about stenos? It means strength. Oh, similar strength, similar concentration, the same osmolality of the urine every time. Cannot concentrate it, cannot dilute it. And that's why the classic description is that the specific gravity or the concentration of the urine is low and fixed in chronic kidney failure. You know, this word reminds me of what? Of myasthenia. Myo means muscle. A means no, stenos, strength, myasthenia, no muscle strength. Cause medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Where does the kidney get its blood supply from? From the renal artery. Where did we get that blood from? From the heart, of course, from the left ventricle, then aorta, then the abdominal aorta, renal artery, which has the renal blood flow. And then do you care about all of the blood? No, I just want the plasma because normal kidneys should not let red blood cells go through. So I just want the renal plasma flow. And how much is that? Well, it's the renal blood flow minus the hematocrit. So let's say that the hematocrit is 40 45%. Therefore, the renal plasma flow is 55% of the renal blood flow. 
Okay, now we have renal plasma flowing inside the renal artery. How much of that will actually get filtered? This is called the GFR, and it's about 20% of the renal plasma flow. How about the other 80%? What's going to happen to them? They will go to the afferent arterial and then to the peritubular capillaries, and they will act as a force that will help you reabsorb or secrete anything you want. What's the normal cardiac output? About 5 liters per minute. Does the kidney receive all of the blood in the body? No, we still have to feed the brain, the heart, the gut, the liver, etc. So the kidney will receive about one-fourth of the cardiac output. Some textbooks will say one-fifth. I don't care. It's about one liter or one liter and a quarter per minute. Do we care about all of that blood? No, just give me the plasma. So 55% of that, which is about 600 mLs per minute. Is all of this getting filtered? No, just 20% of that, which is 125 mLs per minute. What do you call that? Glomerular filtration rate, which normally should be above 100. And of course, this depends on your age. So look at this. Your GFR is normally 125 mLs per minute. Per minute. How many minutes do we have in an hour? 60 minutes. And how many hours in a day? 24 hours. And therefore, your kidney filters how many liters every day? 180 liters per day. Now, how many liters of plasma does your entire body have right now? Only three liters, which means that your kidney filters your plasma 60 times every day. You cannot match a normal kidney. Poor patients who are on dialysis, they go to the hospital twice or thrice a week, not 60 times a day. So, if your kidney function is normal, you should be grateful. Normally speaking, the urea is the metabolic end product of protein metabolism, amino acid metabolism, pyrimidine metabolism. Who makes urea? The liver. From whom? From ammonia. Where do you get the ammonia from? From metabolism of proteins and amino acids. And then when the liver converts the ammonia into urea in the urea cycle, then you have urea in the blood. Who should get rid of that? My kidney. But in kidney failure, do you think I'll be able to get rid of that urea? No, all of that urea will pile up in my blood. You call this uremia. Many of these toxic waste products that accumulate in the blood are acidic, such as sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid, lactic acid, uric acid, you name. And that's why this can lead to metabolic acidosis. That was the story of urea. How about creatinine then? Creatinine came from creatine phosphate metabolism, which is in the muscle. So normally, creatine phosphate gets metabolized into creatinine. Creatinine goes to the blood, and then it should be excreted by your kidney. As your kidney function deteriorates, creatinine clearance goes down, leaving more creatinine behind in the blood. So I have too much urea in the blood and too much creatinine in the blood. That that's right. How about urine volume? It's low. What do you call it when you have tons of urea in the blood? Uremia. Since this urea has nitrogen in it, and the word for nitrogen is azote, we can call this azotemia. Too much nitrogenous waste products in the blood. So in chronic kidney failure, there is uremia. You can call it uremic acidosis. You can call it azotemia. You can call it renal failure, renal insufficiency, end stage renal disease when it's too late. But regardless, GFR is decreased increasing, urine volume is poor, bio and creatinine in the blood are high. Most of these waste products are acidic, so it gives me high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Here is normal. The difference between the unmeasured cations and the unmeasured anions, i.e. this box right here, is called the anion gap. When my kidney fails, all of that uric acid, sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid, and gazillion other compounds will pile up in the blood. These are unmeasured anions, which will increase the anion gap. From this to this. If this increased, something else has to decrease, and this is Mr. Bicarbonate. Bicarbonate went from, let's say, 24 milli equivalents per liter into 15 milli equivalents per liter. But the serum chloride did not change. That's why, in cases of acute or chronic renal failure, we have high anion gap metabolic acidosis. pH is low, anion gap is high, bicarbonate is low, serum chloride is normal, hagma is normochloremic. Can this poor kidney with chronic kidney disease excrete all the acids? No, therefore all of that acid will end up in my blood, giving me metabolic acidosis. 
The GFR is poor. I am unable to excrete the inorganic wastes, the phosphates, the sulfates, the negatively charged anions. And that's why the anion gap gets wider and wider and wider. Who will have to be consumed in order to try to buffer all of this insanity? Bicarbonate. So it decreases. Moreover, the pore tubules will leak the bicarbonate into the toilet. Pore tubules could not reabsorb bicarbonate. It ends up in the toilet. The lower your serum bicarbonate, the greater your risk of mortality. Mortality. Do you recall the difference between acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease? Well, the acute happens fast, days or weeks. How about the chronic? No, it takes months. For me to diagnose you with chronic kidney disease, you have to have all of these issues for more than three months. Otherwise, we will not call it chronic. Causes of acute renal failure, as we have discussed before, are either hypoxic or toxic, i.e. ischemic or nephrotoxic. How about the chronic renal failure? could be diabetes or hypertension. This is the number one most common cause and this is the second most common. Acute renal failure, reversible, chronic, irreversible. And as we have discussed before, remember that the causes are diabetes, hypertension, chronic glomerulonephritis, chronic pyelonephritis, cystic kidney disease, hyperuricemia, hyperparathyroidism, and others. As the chronic kidney disease gets worse and worse and worse, the fibrosis and sclerosis get worse, leaving less space for the proteins to leak. So actually the proteinuria gets better. Can you believe it? Is diabetes bad for the kidney? Yes, it's the number one most common cause of chronic kidney disease. How about hypertension? Also, yes. Hypertension can ruin my kidney and a bad kidney can raise my blood pressure. To learn more about how diabetes and hypertension can affect your kidney, check out these separate videos in my 5-minute review playlist. You can also find them here in the nephrology playlist. So now let's focus on the diagnosis and management of chronic kidney disease. First, signs and symptoms. Don't forget, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, anorexia, intense uremic itching, uremic skin frosting, the chalky white deposits, uremic facies, sometimes described as pale, toxic facies, because all of the toxins are in the blood. Skin is pale, sometimes I get edema and sleep disorders with cognitive decline, sometimes hemorrhagic gastritis. Uremia can lead to encephalopathy and seizures. Uremia can lead to pleurisy with friction rub that is biphasic. Uremia can lead to pericarditis, another friction rub that is triphasic and does not disappear when you hold your breath unlike the pleurisy. Don't forget that the uremic pericarditis is usually painless. No pain and no classic EKG findings. Do not expect to see the diffuse ST elevations in most leads, nor the PR depression. Uremic pericarditis has a relatively poor prognosis. Uremic pericarditis is an indication that you need to start dialysis right now. Patients with chronic kidney disease can have anemia for reasons that we discussed before, the most important of which which is low EPO, and uremia is toxic to my platelets by inhibiting the GP2B3A receptor necessary for platelet aggregation. So, in chronic kidney disease, red blood cell count, low, hemoglobin, low, hematocrit, also low. How about MCV? Usually normal, because this is normocytic anemia. How about platelet count? Normal, but bleeding time is prolonged, because the platelet number is fine, but the platelet function sucks. In chronic kidney disease, we have hypovitaminosis D, hypocalcemia, at least in the beginning, hyperphosphatemia. All of these will raise the parathyroid hormone, which will start to resorb and break down your bones, giving you all kinds of bone problems. Astitis fibrosis cystica, renal osteodystrophy, osteomalacia, and osteoporosis. We can diagnose osteoporosis using the DEXA scan, which we have discussed in the last video, which was titled Renal Osteodystrophy. Anytime you have metabolic acidosis that is severe enough, you will exchange that hydrogen for potassium, and you will end up with hyperkalemia, and you will exchange some of that hydrogen with calcium from the bones, so you can end up with hypercalcemia and weak bones. Let's review some signs and symptoms of end-stage kidney disease. In the head, cognitive decline, uremic encephalopathy. Face, uremic toxic pale facies. Heart, uremic pericarditis and cardiomyopathy. Lungs, pleurisy and other issues. How about my gut, nausea, vomiting? 
fatigue, anorexia, and sometimes hemorrhagic gastritis. How about my bones? All kinds of bone diseases, including renal osteodystrophy, osteitis fibrosa cystica, also known as brown bone tumors. They are brown because of hemosiderin. You can also get osteomalacia or osteoporosis. As for the bone marrow, the poor guy cannot make enough red blood cells, so you get anemia. And the platelets suck at their function, you get thrombasthenia. In the next video, we'll talk about ostitis fibrosis cystica, the diagnosis and management of chronic kidney disease. Then we'll compare between acute renal failure and chronic renal failure. After that, we'll talk tubular interstitial nephritis, acute interstitial nephritis, pyelonephritis, acute and chronic, nephrosclerosis, renal infarction, renal papillary necrosis, renal cell carcinoma, and much more. These videos will be found in my nephrology playlist. If you want to learn about the normal kidney function, please download my renal physiology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. If you want more urology topics, such as hypospadias, epispadias, low implantation of the ureter, trauma to the urethra, and much more, download my surgery high yields course. And to learn about preeclampsia and eclampsia, which can destroy the kidney in cases of pregnancy, download my obstetrix gynecology high yields course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. If you do not want to download my courses and would rather watch them right here on YouTube, click the join button and subscribe to the highest tier. Hit the subscribe button and click the bell. Support my channel here or here. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.